short offering song. You can't even fix it. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity that you give us. We do give thanks. <clears throat> Waking us up, giving us love, giving us food. So many things that uh, we appreciate. Mm. May we continue to give an attitude of gratitude. Not when we don't have it, but while we do have it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're in Revelation chapter 2, in verses 12 through 17, concerning the church of Pergamon, which was a compromising church. One of the descriptions that John saw in chapter 1, verse 16, was that of a two edged sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus. This symbol represents his word, which will correct to bring repentance or correct with the sword of war. Now these two false doctrines that Jesus was addressing, Baalism and Nicolism, <coughs> Baalism was the first step to compromise that led to Nicolism, which is antinomianism. And what does that mean? That means once you're under grace, you can live like the devil, basically. It's kind of like that thought, though I believe in salvation is eternal, it's once saved, always saved. And so antinomianism, which the Nicolaitans were practicing, was kind of like the final step of Baalism. Baalism was a baby step where they would eat the things that were sacrificed to the idols, the false gods, and then they would also sleep with the prostitutes that were involved in that religion. So it was like a subtle, subtle step into antinomianism, which is the final step of believing that there's no moral restraint. You now practice it. So the Lord Jesus was addressing these two issues, and he said, I'm going to do it with the sword of my mouth, which is his word. He said, either you'll receive correction, or I'm going to come at war against this doctrine and those who practice it. So here we go, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church of, in Pergamon write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. So let's talk about the two-edged sword again. It's coming out of Jesus' mouth. Now obviously it's not a, a literal sword that Jesus is going to come back with coming out of his mouth. But the sword is his word. Ephesians talk about... Uh, the sword of his word, that's an offensive weapon for the Christians. It also tells us about his word being a sword in Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and it's active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joint and marrow, and it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God says is alive. Now, you know, you don't see it pulsating in the book, but the word of God is the word of God. It's not man-made, it's what God breathed and what God allowed the apostles to write down his very thoughts. And it's able to penetrate our hearts and separate our motives from our soul, from our spirit. The word of God, everything he said will pass away, but the word of the Lord will remain yes. forever. Yes. The word of the Lord is God himself. A man is honored by his word. If his word, if he doesn't match up to his word, then you say, ah, he's unfaithful, he's not a good person. But God is always faithful, so his word is who he is. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God in John chapter 1, verse 1. So the sword is his word. And then we read in the end, in Revelation 19, 15, when he comes back after the trip, uh, right, right, right after the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation where all of hell is going to break loose, he comes back with his saints and with the angels on a symbolically a white horse, which is victory, and it says this, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, 
so that with it he may strike down the nations. So again, it's going to be his word. All the Lord has to say is, Poof, gone, gone. He doesn't have to pick up an actual sword. So it's symbolic to cut asunder these false doctrines that he's going to address in this city of Pergamon. So in verse 13 of Revelation 2, he says, Now I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne, we're going to talk about that in a minute, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Anubis, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So let's talk about where Satan's throne is. As Vinny was saying, it's a spiritual warfare that's going on. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 12, Daniel was praying, fasting for 21 days, and it tells us that the angel Gabriel couldn't get to him to give him an answer because the prince of Persia was stopping him. Not a literal prince, but he said he was stopping him until Michael, the archangel, came to help him. So there's a spiritual fight that goes on between God's angels and the devil's angels. Let me read. Now Gabriel, that, who gives this message, says this, I have come in response to your words, Daniel, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So there are strongholds. And so he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And this was in Pergamon. Pergamon had a lot of false idols there. Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite. And it was the throne where Satan was dwelling. Interesting that there are certain countries you go to and you can sense more of darkness than in other locations. There are different strongholds in different areas where Satan is stronger. I'll give you an example. In Matthew 17, when the apostles couldn't drive out the demon out of the young boy, uh, Jesus came and of course he drove the demon out. But he said to his pop, they said, why couldn't we do this? And he said, because of your unbelief and because this kind does not come out except through prayer and fasting. So there are strongholds, there are stronger demons in different places than there are in all the same. So he says here, I know where you are, speaking to that church, where Satan's throne is, it's a stronghold, and you held fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, we don't know who he was, but he was a martyr, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Satan always wanted a throne to be worshipped. That was the reason he got banned from heaven and kicked out of heaven. In Isaiah 14, 13, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, and I will raise my throne above the stars, the angels of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. So the heights of the clouds represents God's glory. When Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory, clouds are just representing the glory of God. When the cloud ascended or descended on the tabernacle where Moses was, that's where God's presence was. So the clouds doesn't necessarily mean it's a literal cloud, but it's his glory coming. So here was a prophecy or here was a word from the Lord that this devil, this Satan guy, the leader of the angels, wanted to become like God. And then if you turn to, and I won't, Ezekiel 28 gives you more of a detail that he was the, the most highest cherubim who was protecting the throne of God until pride was found inside of him. 
and then he was cast down. So yeah, there's a spiritual war that goes on, but he said, hold fast. <laughs> because I know what's going on. I want you to see what he says here about Antipas. Notice he says that my witness, my faithful one, notice the, the personal name that he knows. He doesn't say, and also this guy, Antipas, but he says, my faithful one. He's my witness. And that's how God sees you. If you belong to Christ, you're his. He says, you're my people. You're my child. You are mine. And I see all that you're going through. I see the attacks of Satan. I see Satan trying to take away your faith of believing in me, but hold fast because you're mine. Yes. He knows your name. In John 10, 3, it says he calls his own sheep by name. Mm. You know, when someone's important and they call you by name, they say, let's say, for instance, uh, your boss, and you work at a big place and he's the executive, he's of high rank and you hardly ever see him. He's, He's up on the hundredth floor and you're down on the first floor. And he comes down and he says, hey, John, you do good work. He's like, whoa, he knows my name? How does he know my name? Well, I, I know your name because it's been trickled in of the work you do. See, God knows your name. As important as he is, he's God. He can know everyone's name at the same time and give everyone the same love at the same time. But he said, my witness, my faithful one. So he calls his sheep by name and he puts forth all his own in verse 4 and he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. <clears throat> so you if you belong to Jesus Christ you have his Holy Spirit and he's teaching you to know his voice. He's leading you and all of a sudden you say wow this is not coincidence. How did this all happen? It's the Holy Spirit that's been leading you. Can I get an amen? Yes, Lord. And you start learning his voice. It's like a new language, the spirit language. Because if you go to another country and you start off trying to understand, you probably just know one or two words. You know, for me, Spanish, bathroom, bano, you know, <laughs> or taco, you know, quesadilla. That was my first <laughs> understanding going into a, an Italian restaurant in, in California. All I ordered would be quesadillas. But first I called it qu quesadillas or something like that. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> but then as time goes on, you start learning the language. You learn how to speak it. You, you learn better words. You have a bigger vocabulary. You have a bigger experience when you know the language. And so as we're learning God's voice, we start learning a bigger experience. We start communicating. He starts to, you just say, wow, this is, this is rich. So he said, my sheep, I go before them. They know my voice. I know them by name. So keep that in mind of who you are, even when you're going through the trials and tribulations. So now after this encouraging word to this church, and I love how the Lord does that because he doesn't always bring up the negative. He brings up first the positive. He says, I know there are people in your church that are doing the right thing, who are wholly faithful. And I think that's a good way if you bring correction to someone. Don't always right away say, yeah, you always do this, and here's where you're wrong. Say, you know, oh, you've been such a good boy. You've been such a good, you know, you've done all of this and all of that, but you didn't make your bed this morning. Rather than, you didn't make your bed this morning. Get back at it. You know, you, you want to first encourage them in what they have done. Amen? Amen? And that's what the Lord does here. He says, I know your faithfulness. You're on target. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Baal. We'll talk about what that teaching is. And who kept teaching Balak, who was the king of the Moabites. We'll talk about that. To put a stumbling block before the children of Israel... What was it? To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So there were some who were teaching the teaching of Baal. 
And when you go to Numbers chapter 31 and verse 16, it tells us, Behold, these cause, that is, these ladies that came up, caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Baal. Baal counseled that to trespass against the Lord. And that was to invite them to, to eat of the uh, menu that was sacrificed to the idols. It always begins with just a little taste. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. They lost patience. The Bible tells us so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. So what happened was King Balak hired this false prophet, Bel, to curse Israel that was on their borderline and ready to go into the promised land. He said, curse these people, they're, they're, they're all over the place. We don't stand a chance, curse them. I'll pay you good. So Balaam said, okay, let me, let, me, let me check in with the Lord first. Now, this guy Balaam is mysterious. Some think that he really had a bona fide experience with God and was serving God, but he wasn't. But he had a connection, and I say this because the Bible says, some will say in the end, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And he'll say, I don't know you, you workers of iniquity. <laughs> Get out of here. They couldn't go to heaven. Though they did miracles and though they did signs, their <laughs> lifestyle was not practicing what they truly believed in. And that's what antinomianism is. It's saying, hey, I'm a Christian, and once saved, always saved, and I believe that, but I believe your fruit, your life will show it. It will be evidence. But if you don't have evidence and you say, no, I'm saved, I can live like the devils, you, you're going to hell. Right. That's what the scripture says. You're deceived. You're, you're deceiving yourself. Now, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that truly sanctifies us and conforms us to his image. I can't do it. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. From the very beginning to the very end, it's his grace, it's his grace, it's his grace. But don't use grace as a license. Well, how many times should I ask God for forgiveness? He said 70 times 7. That means it's, it's indefinite. Always ask for forgiveness. God is merciful. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. amen? So it tells us here, this is how Balaam instructed King Balak to get at the children of Israel. Bal Balak said, Balaam, I'm going to give you a lot of money. Balaam said, okay, let me check with the Lord. The Lord said, no. And so they said, no, listen, we're going to come back with even more money. And he said, well, all right, let me check with the Lord again. And this time the Lord said, okay, go. And then we see him going on a donkey to go to this place to where King Balak was. And the donkey stopped short and saved his life because the donkey spoke to him and said, Hey, there's an angel up there with a sword ready to kill you. But he was so intent on going. But why did God let him go? Sometimes when you know God's will and you're persistent in wanting to change God's will, you say, all right, you want it? You got it. Go. And you learn a lesson, hopefully. So that was the reason why he told him to go. So he went, he tried to curse Israel. And all he could do was bless Israel. Balak was pulling the hair out of his head saying, I pray you to curse them and all you're doing is blessing them. He said, I can do nothing but what God tells me and speaks through me. I can only bless them. So a second time, the same thing. You're supposed to curse them. I, I can't. I can only bless them because that's what's coming out of me. Third time, the same thing. I can only bless them, not curse them. So he left. Balaam left and went back to his hometown. And somewhere along the line, he came back and spoke to Balak, King Balak, and said, but I do know how you can get at them. God will not curse them, but he'll chasten them. Get your ladies ready to go meet them and offer them this great food so that they can come with you back to their place of worship and get them to bow down with you. So you might say, well, maybe they were just bowing down and didn't mean it, but that's how that God sees it. 
So 22,000 were chastened by the Lord at that time. But I want you to understand that this is very important for all of us. Listen, very important. They were eat, eating manna, which is bread from heaven, for 40 years. You get kind of tired of that, right? 40 years eating the same bread that came down from heaven. Different times God brought quail and what have And now they're at the verge of going into the promised land. Days away. See, if the devil can't get you front ways, he'll get you through the back door. They must have been tired of eating this manna. They must have been tired of walking in the desert for many years, and the hot desert. And boy, it'd be nice to have some of these vegetables and some of this beef that they're offering up to to their gods. Let me have a taste of this. And mm, we're tired of that manna. And then you know what? They're also given free sex, immorality. We're almost there. I'm sure God will understand. You say, wow. How does that apply to me? Well, here it is. Maybe you've been following God for 40 years, 10 years, one year. And you get kind of tired of it sometimes. Well, it's the same thing. I go to church on Sunday. I seek the Lord. I read the Bible. Uh, I meet the same people, and you know, I, I'm kind of, kind of weary of, of just eating this manna, the Word of God. Isn't there other things I can do? I, I get tired. Isn't there some, you know, outside stuff I, I can partake in and and start, you know, boogaloo a little bit or whatever you want to call it? And that's how the devil gets you. Yeah. He doesn't outright tell you, "Hey, don't go to church and don't go to church. Listen, have a little taste. You follow God all these years. But that's how compromise comes. Compromise comes a little at a time. And before you know it, you're out there in the world. Yeah, this is too restricted for me. This Christian stuff was good at the beginning. The first year I was on the honeymoon. Man, I was doing everything for the Lord. I felt good. Ah. Now it's getting a little wearisome. Listen, I feel that too. But if I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall towards God, not away from God. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to say, God, give me your mercy because I'm getting a little tired now, please. And he does. He says, I got it, John. Yeah, yeah, I know your name, pal. I'm here for you. You're with me. I'm okay. But don't be deceived. You're so close. The promises of God are all yea and amen. They were so close to the promised land. They were just days away. And you're just so close to the promises that God has made with you. It's a promise he made to you. It says, through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So be a little more patient. Don't buy this stuff and think a little of the world is going to help you. It's not. It's going to come compromise your spirit, and then before you know it, you're going to be loving the world, you're going to be in it, and you know how this happens? Let me start with that. At first you feel a little prick in your heart, ah, yeah. and then all of a sudden you don't feel that no more. All of a sudden it's normal. God, yeah, I, I, I'm saved, I know God, yeah. But I don't have to build myself up on my most holy faith. God's God, you know, he's not, no, you can't go that route, folks. You're lying to yourself when the devil's tricking you. He's out to take you out. Not to take you into heaven. He's out to take you out of heaven. So, James tells me this, and we're getting close to the end here. He called, well, it was idolatry that they were sinning against God by offering, by bowing down to these false gods. The devil got through them through their belly and, and through sex. And that's how the devil gets to a lot of men. Men love to eat. You know, you get a good wife who knows how to cook, you're in. But uh, otherwise, you know, it's burger king. <laughs> <clears throat> but also for men, it's immorality. For men, it has to do a lot. Because men are very visual. Men see very clearly. 
It's the women who are more emotional, and I don't mean that negatively, but they're more sentimental, they sense more, they're more compassionate. Man, yeah, we'll live in a cave. No, I want a home. I want to get a house. No, I want to decorate it. Okay, let's put a picture on the wall. <laughs> so this is the beauty of a woman. They're so different, and they just do things like that. But men are visual. And especially during the summer, you know, men you go, you know, you go down to places, a beach or whatever, and you gotta close your eyes. Because it's not like they know any better, maybe they don't. But it, it, it begins with the look, and then before you know it, the imagination, and then before you know it, you're taking steps towards it. So that's what happened with these men. One quick note on this. In the chapter, <clears throat> Sir, I forget his name now, was one of the elders, and he brings one of the women, the midnight women, into his tent. And there was Moses weeping at the tent of where God dwells with, I don't know, maybe Aaron, they were both weeping, and this crazy dude brings this woman right into his tent, right in front of them, right in front of them. And one of the uh, priests is, his name was Phineas, ran and got a spear and went into the tent and <sighs> speared right through both of them. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And then the plague was stopped, but 22,000 men had to die. God is holy, but he's very compassionate and merciful. And the devil is unmerciful. And he'll try to get you through the back door. If he can't get you through the front door, he'll get you through compromise. So be careful of compromising because a little leaven starts leveling the whole love. So he said, you adulteresses and James, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Therefore, submit you therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You can't live in both camps. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. There is no temptation that is common to man that has overtaken you. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted more than what you are able, but with that temptation, he will provide a way of escape. Therefore, flee from immorality. Flee from the sin that's knocking at your door, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We all get tempted. As one pastor once said, you know, the birds will always come to land on your head, but don't let them nest. You're going to get thoughts, but don't let them nest. God is faithful. And I can tell you this. As time goes on as a Christian, you can become more laxed. More of a compromise. You've been there, done that, you know the story. My admonition is we're too close to the promised land. We're too close to Christ coming back. You're too close. He's coming back. And you want to be ready. You don't want to now just let the devil take you at the one yard line and fumble the ball. You're in for a touchdown. Can I get an amen? amen. We have to build ourselves up. You cannot allow yourself to compromise. And that was what's happening with this church of Pergamon. And God was chasing them. So one more thought. So Balak wanted Balaam to curse Israel. He couldn't do it. And I want to say to you, you cannot be cursed. I've heard people say I'm under a generational curse. No such thing. Why? Because here's what the scripture says. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ became a curse for you. Before you came to Christ, you were under the curse, the curse of sin. 
We were, we were going to hell. If you don't keep the law entirely, you're cursed. And when you die, you go to hell. But Christ said, I'm going to take all their sins. I'm going to take the curse. So he became a curse for me so that I can go to heaven with him. He paid the price. Can I get an amen? amen. But notice it says that we would receive the blessing amen. of Abraham through the Spirit by faith. By faith. All the blessings that God has for you and me, we receive by faith. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You are blessed. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as other generational curse? You're wrong. The devil tricked you. Christ is my curse. All foods, well, I don't eat certain pork. Well, okay, you don't have to. But it's not sin. The Bible says all things are clean to them who pray. And there's the God's blessing over it. But if one wants to not do it, that's fine. I, I don't stumble up for that. But I will say clearly, if you think you're under a curse, you're wrong. God says he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Can I get an amen? Yes. And you receive those blessings through faith and patience. Don't go back. It's there. You're more than a conqueror in Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. That's my wife that said hallelujah. Can someone else say hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. In verse 15 and 16. So now he goes to the Nicolaitans. Now some have said, scholars don't know exactly what they were teaching. I lean to where they were teaching the things of Baalism, which was sacrificing to idols, eating their food, but more than that, they were locked in to this antinomianism type of doctrine that said, hey, we're saved by grace, doesn't matter what we do. So he says, some, well, let me back up, some say the Nicolaitans came from this person, Nicole, which is found in Acts chapter six, he was one of the seven that, uh, that they chose to feed the widows. And because the name of Nico is there and Laetans, it, it's a ruler over the layman, Laetans, layman. And that there was a hierarchy where they control, this person would control that particular religious system. But I don't take it. Some do, that's fine. I take it as them being against God's grace. So again, he says, I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. So that means if they're not going to repent with the sword, he's going to make war with them with the sword. What that means, I don't know. But I do know, as you read in different books here, people have died. And even as Christians, some have died who were Profaning the Lord's Supper. He says that's why some of you are asleep, which are dead, because they were abusing the Lord's Supper. And that's a whole other story. But, you know, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And sometimes if we're not going to be changing with his word of the sword, it could be a, it could be a prick in the heart. Oh, man, Lord, okay, I get it, I get it. And sometimes that humbles us. And humble is not bad. Can I get an amen? amen. Getting humble, it's, it's coming to that place of being humble that hurts. But when you're weak, you're more open. Okay, Lord, you know, I don't care about what I wear anymore, just as long as it's clothes. You know, and, you know, I don't care about my food anymore, just as long as I get food on the table. But when you get a little strong, oh, I want this, I want that, I gotta wear this, I gotta have that. But then when you start losing things, when you start getting hungry, you say, that's not important. What's important is my relationship with you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that's what really counts. So he said, I'll make war with you. So again, I'll write down, you can write down, antinomianism teaches that because God's grace is greater than all of our sin, we are no longer under any obligation to obey God's law. So you could say, well, I've never seen anyone like that. Well, good. But there are people who think once saved, always saved, and I'm saying you can't lose your salvation. My point is they were never saved. But <clears throat> there are people who say, Hey, it's under the blood, it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Oh, be careful of that. It could be a delusion that you're living in 
And you don't want to wake up one day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? He's going to say, hey, I don't know you, pal. So get right with the Lord. There's freedom in the Lord. For you were called to freedom, brethren. <coughs> Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You got freedom. You're in Christ. You got freedom. But be careful that that freedom doesn't give you now opportunity to go further with it and use it as an opportunity for your flesh. Verse 17. We're ready to close now. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is plural. So it's just not to perfect. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. We'll talk about that. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So let's break it down. He who has a spiritual ear, let him hear that God's principles and God's truth remain the same. If you overcome, he's speaking to this church, but he's also speaking to all of us. If you overcome these temptations that are coming at you, you say, well, how can I overcome it? Well, you overcome through the word. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Be consistent. We first begin with Revelation 12, 11. They, the saints, overcame him, the devil, by number one, the blood of the Lamb. That's your salvation for your soul. And by the word of their testimony, don't put your light under the bed. Your testimony is important. You know what it does to others? It gives them hope. But it also strengthens your faith. But if you're afraid to speak about your faith, it's a hindrance. You know, I'm saved by the blood of Christ. I'm proud. Yeah, I'm not proud in the bad sense, but... You know, I don't wear a sandwich board sign. I'm saved and walk around 42nd Street. Mm -hmm. But if someone asks, you know, hey, what's up with you? Well, man, I, I, let me tell you something, what I was uh, like one time. You, you didn't want to know me then. Uh, but what God has done for me through Jesus Christ is amazing. Uh -huh. And so you start practicing your testimony. If you truly believe something, you want to speak about it, right? If you got a wife, you don't want to hide her. Hey, you married? I'm gonna take the ring off. Yeah, I guess I'm married. No, you, you're proud. And this is my wife. Where is she anyway? <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't want to hide it. You speak. Get again, an amen, right? And so he said, by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb, and lastly, they love not their life even to death. What does that mean? When you follow Christ, you're losing your life. So back to Satan's throne. Christ left his throne so that he could sit on the throne of your heart. So we ask the question, who's on the throne of your heart? The Satan? The things of the devil? The flesh? Is that how you live your life? Because everyone lives out in the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen to your words, listen to what is a priority in your life. That tells me, and it should tell you, if you're honest with yourself, where I am with the Lord. And that's so important, and I'll just move on from there. This is very important. It says with a, a, with a, uh, a good heart, with an honest and good heart and perseverance in raw fruit. The soils, three soils, rocky soil, right? soil that landed on the rocks it didn't it was temporary blue it grew up and died and then there was other seed that fell upon the weeds and the weeds choked it out because it had no root and that's represented christians who would first come to the lord first the seed of god's word that it goes on the on the rocky soil but it has has no depth and it, it withers quickly when taught when uh, taught when i talk to when, when the sun torches on them, trials come they, they disappear the other seed fell among the weeds, and the weeds choke it out. That's the cares and worries of the world. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. And it, it says they wake up joyful. Yes, but it's only temporary. And then 
The cares and worries of this world choke it out. And that happens to us if we're not careful. Different priorities start coming into our life. The cares and worries. Well, I got to do this. I gotta, yeah, I, I'm a responsible man. And I understand that. But I want to prioritize. Put God first. Hear me out. Put God first and he'll take care of the rest. Can I get an amen? Yes. That's the principle. You lose your life. Oh, I got to make it happen. I got to make Lose your life at a point and say, Lord, I'm putting you first. Amen. Come what may. If I die, I die. But you're first. And when you make him first, he's going to take care of you. You'll see. He's always done it. And he'll do it to you. He's done it to me. And the seed that fell on the good soil... It says, with a good and honest heart, with perseverance, it bore fruit. So there's a couple elements here. An honest heart. You've got to be honest with yourself. If you're not honest with yourself, if you can't be really, brutally honest, is a word I remember hearing one day. To be brutally honest and say, who's kidding who? Oh, God, show me my heart and see if there's any wicked stuff inside. You can have a seat, bro. I didn't say you can talk about it. <laughs> you know, with, with a good and honest heart, with perseverance, it bore fruit. So persevering is, is something that you have to, and I have to always go through. But I can always rely on God's grace and God, whoa, he's persevering. I'm hanging on by a thread, but I'm putting you first. And I, and I see why I'm making excuses. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, I got this to do. Uh, I got a wife to support. I got I got uh, this to do, and I got that to do. And we all make excuses. That sound legit. But God said, "No, you follow me first. Amen. And that's the meaning of following Christ and putting Him on the throne of your life, amen. and let Him sit there, let Him rule your life. And brothers and sisters, it's too close to game time. We're getting raptured soon. Amen. And you want to be there, be raptured up with the rest of the saints. And just say goodbye to this world. So let's go real quick. So he says, I will give you hidden manna. What is the hidden manna? Jesus is the manna. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, he'll not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. So does that mean you don't get physically hungry? No. Does that mean you'll never get physically thirsty? No. He's talking about spiritual thirst. People want to be filled with something other than what this world is offered. So that's the hidden manna. When you overcome and you overcome your flesh, you will taste the bread of life, Jesus, and he will satisfy. Can I get an amen? amen. He satisfies. And then the second one, he will also give them a white stone. Now back in the day, if you were found guilty, they would, I guess the juror would come out with a black stone, guilty. And if you were found innocent, you would get a white stone, meaning you, you're innocent. You, you've been absolved. So he says, I will give you a white stone of acceptance. That's what that is. Christ accepted you, it tells me in Ephesians 1.6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made you, me, accepted in the beloved. Do you accept yourself? With all of your warts, I hope you do. You're not perfect. You'll never be perfect. This is not a perfect church. You'll never be a perfect church. Why? Because you're imperfect. And I am perfect. No. Because we're all imperfect. And we're all in this together. Rowing the boat for Jesus. And Jesus is in the helm. He says, yeah, hey, forward. And we follow him. Can I get an amen? Yeah, right. So he says here, you've been accepted in Christ. Not in your own religiosity. Not in your good works, but only in what he has accomplished on the cross for you. It's a gift. Say amen if you can. It's a gift. Hallelujah. I'll take it. Bless. But he also says this. He will put a new name written on that stone that no one knows but that person who receives it. So what does that mean? That new name is very clear. 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things come new. Back in my day, in the ugliness of my days, my, I had a nickname, John John, two Johns. There was only one. Maybe he had two heads, I don't know. But John John. 
And so that name associates me with evil. I, so when I came to Christ and I started following Christ, and I would walk with my, my, new, my old friends, I didn't have no Christian friends, and I didn't want to follow what they were doing, but hey, John, John, come on. John, my name is John. Oh, what's up with that? Mm. I'm a Christian now. Amen. I have a new name. Amen. And so you are a new person now. You have a new name. Don't go back to the old stuff. You don't need that old stuff. It's, it's, it's dead. It's wicked. It's going to take you under. Yep. I, 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 I'm a new creation. Hallelujah. Right? Hallelujah. I don't Amen. dwell on my past. I don't dwell on the negative stuff. I, I live by the Lord and by His grace. And it says that no one knows that name but you yourself. It's a personal relationship that God wants with you. Just you, not with church, not with Horizon. But he wants to communicate to you and give you that assurance that you are accepted in me. The best gift you could ever have is to hear the Lord say to you, you're mine, I know your name. You've accepted my son Jesus, I love you. I'll always love you. You're coming with me to heaven forever. My son paid the price. When you get that assurance, the world can't do nothing to you unless you allow it to. So as the worship team comes up, the key that the Lord was speaking to this church was a key, was love. He said, hey, I know, man. It's, it's, it's you've been faithful in so many areas of your life. You've been doing the right thing. Even when it's been hard, you, you still were faithful, you still, and I believe you're, you're still mine if you belong to Christ, He's, you're still His, even when we fall. We still belong to him if you believe that. You just got to ask for forgiveness, that's all. So with every head bowed, if, if someone here has never received the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus Christ,